Hello everybody. Welcome to Dr. Sam's Anatomy Classes. Here I'm going to solve this question paper of anatomy of first terminal exam held at Narayana Medical College and Research Center, Kanpur. This exam was of MBBS 2022 batch students conducted on 27th of February 2023. And this exam was of two parts. Part 1. Part 1 was of 50 marks and part 2. This also was of 50 marks. And the pattern of this exam was same as Atal Bihari Vajpayee Medical University to which this medical college is affiliated. So there was this first long question which is a structured long question or either a clinically oriented question. This is of 15 marks then 5 marks 3 questions which makes 15 marks, 2 marks ultra short questions that makes it 10 marks and then 1 mark each for 10 MCQs. So this was 50 marks of part 1, part 2 again here, 15 marks long structured question, 5 marks short answer questions, 3 questions so 15 marks and 5 such ultra short questions. This was of 2 marks each so 10 marks for this and 10 MCQs. So this is the pattern we are following which is being followed by Atal Bihari Vajpayee Medical University. Okay then question number one, a 50 year old lady came to the surgeon with complaints of firm painless mass in the upper lateral quadrant of her right breast. On examination the nipple was found to be retracted. Axillary lymph nodes were also palpable and firm. She was diagnosed as a case of breast cancer. So all these points remember firm painless mass these are suggestive of carcinoma especially when it gets adherent or fixed to the underlying tissues and this retraction of nipple this also is a sign of carcinoma breast then there were palpable and firm lymph nodes in the axil also so what are the structures lying deep to the breast this is a simple question talking about the bed of the breast and you know that its pectoral is major mainly and serratus anterior to little extent the external oblique abdominis and a little bit of the portion of rectus sheath. Describe the lymphatic drainage of the breast. Now this is a long portion right so to describe the entire lymphatic drainage the superficial the deep the intercostal and to the opposite breast and even the shedding of the cells reaching down below to the diaphragm Krukenbach's tumor, in the secondary carcinomas, everything. Then what causes the retraction of the nipples? Now this, as I told you, this already is a sign of carcinoma breast. When you know this carcinoma flares up, it involves the ducts behind the nipples and the areola, pulling it in. So that's a sign of, one of the sign of carcinoma breast. The others are puckering of the skin or dimpling of the skin. Now that's because of the involvement of the suspensory ligament of Cooper's. If it's a single ligament pulling it in, that makes a dimple. But if many ligaments po pull a portion of the breast inside, that makes it puckering of the skin. Then what is the anatomical basis of PUD orange? This is another sign of carcinoma breast where there is obstruction of the superficial lymphatics. Remember that skin do has small little uh, ligaments beneath and the involvement of the sweat glands Remember this is because of the obliteration of the superficial lymphatics and because of the porosity of the sweat glands, the skin appears like a PUD orange. Explain the anatomical basis of the spread of the cancer to the vertebrae. Of course, it lies over the intercostal spaces. So the intercostal lymphatics, intercostal veins, they spread the cancer cells into the internal vertebral plexus and even to the lymphatics reaching up the vertebrae and the intercostal lymph nodes lying on either sides of the vertebrae, paravertebral lymph nodes. Question number two, write short notes on quadriceps femoris muscle. This, you know, is a composite muscle of the front of thigh. I need not describe here and waste your time. So it's better you read it from the book. The next is axillary artery and its branches. For this, I have made a video, a well explained video in detail explaining all the relations, cores, branches, including the location of various groups of axillary lymph nodes and even including the anastomosis at the back of scapula. It's a good video, you must watch. 
the next one is deltoid this also is an important muscle so deltoid you need to explain very well the anterior the posterior the lateral fibers the multipinnate fibers the lateral side right the clinical significance and its various actions it's this muscle capable of doing all the actions at the shoulder joint so go through this muscle either from the book or you can even watch the video i have made on deltoid muscle it's a dissection video i have explained all about the deltoid muscle now the short answer questions these ultra short questions you have to explain in less than 100 words and these short note questions you have to explain in less than 500 words so question number three a it's simple squamous epithelium so you have to describe the epithelium and mention all the examples you know endothelium pleura peritoneum serous pericardium loop of henley alveoli the lung parenchyma all these examples you can mention next question is femoral nerve this femoral nerve you can describe it in less than 100 words i believe by the help of a diagram but remember you have to include the cutaneous branches the genicular branches the autonomic branches apart from the muscular branches now the next question is primary cartilaginous joints this is important question from the general anatomy portion this chapter of joints in the general anatomy portion is very commonly asked so the entire chapter you should read before going for the exams so remember that primary cartilaginous joints the best example you know it's between the epiphysis and the diaphysis or the long bones and the rest other there are a lot many examples costochondral first chondrosternal sphenooccipital joint joint between pubis ilium ischium right the hip bone being formed since sacrum the intervertebral joints between the body of the sacral vertebrae and lot many and the three joints in each vertebrae where the two pericles join the body of the vertebrae and the two halves of the neural arc of the vertebrae when they join to form the spine of a vertebrae so all this you can mention as the examples of primary cartilaginous joints remember these are temporary joints which undergo synchondrosis that is the fusion of these primary cartilaginous joints at the time of skeletal maturity the next question here again is from the general anatomy portion and that is about the growing into the long bones now there is a very well taught lecture on this so one of the videos in my playlist on general anatomy i am attaching here the video link next question is triangle of auscultation this is a super important question may be asked as an mcq or even an ultra shot or maybe a part of surface anatomy and it's also asked in your vivoc exams so triangle of auscultation i have made a good video watch this video the link is there and talking about these questions the multiple choice questions question number one is lymph from the upper lateral quadrant of breast drains mainly into the dash lymph nodes internal thoracic posterior axillary nodes anterior axillary nodes lateral axillary nodes there you can see in this image that the lateral half mainly especially the upper outer quadrant this drains mainly into this anterior group of axillary lymph nodes so remember it's the anterior axillary group of lymph nodes also called as pectoral group of lymph nodes into which the majority of the superficial lymphatics from the breast they drain through the axillary tail of spens remember that foramen foramen of langer the perforation in the pectoral fascia through which this axillary tail of spens reaches to drain into the anterior group of axillary lymph nodes question number 2 axillary vein is formed by the union of cephalic and basilic vein basilic vein and vena comitans accompanying the brachial artery and funda brachial artery cephalic vein and vena comitans accompanying brachial artery and funda brachial artery basilic and median cubital vein so how is this axillary vein formed here in this image you are seeing is axillary vein you can see it's running parallel along to axillary artery so in the arm you can see what's happening how is this axillary vein being formed have you ever realized that subclavian artery subclavian vein 
both of them they traveling together then both of them continues as axillary artery axillary vein then axillary artery continues as brachial artery then why not brachial vein why don't you have a brachial vein in the arm the reason is first of all you know there is a reverse flow of blood arteries carry blood away from the heart veins carry blood towards the heart so now this vein basilic vein you know this basilic vein is formed on the dorsum of the hand on the ulnar border on the ulnar side where the medial end of the dorsal venous arch joins the medial marginal vein it continues as basilic vein which continues in the front of forearm along the medial border subcutaneously then it becomes the content of the roof of cubital fossa where it receives a tributary that's called median cubital vein now this median cubital vein is actually a branch from cephalic vein but it's a tributary of basilic vein why let me tell you cephalic in its entire length is subcutaneous but basilic becomes a deep vein when it reaches on the medial side of the arm at the mid of the arm it perforates the deep fascia and then it becomes a deep vein now this basilic vein in the upper medial side of the arm when it becomes a deep vein it receives two vena comitants from the brachial artery right so there is a two vena comitants which were running along the brachial artery they will drain into this basilic vein now a deep vein then there are two vena comitantes you can see they are running along with profunda brachial artery paired vena comitantes along with profunda brachial artery so it receives four vena comitants two from the brachial artery and two running along the profunda brachial artery after receiving these four vena comitants now this basilic vein when it reaches the lower border of teres major this you seeing is the lower border of this muscle teres major the green color i have used right and as per the terminology of the axillary artery after crossing the lower border of teres major now this basilic vein which is a deep vein of the upper medial side of the arm it will now be called axillary vein similarly like the branches of the axillary artery there will be the veins and those veins will be the tributaries of the axillary vein in the axilla and it will be crossed by pectoralis minor numbering them as first second and third part of the axillary vein and after crossing the outer border of the first rib this axillary vein will continue as subclavian vein which will be crossing the first rib anterior you can see in the image it will cross the first rib anterior to the sclenius anterior muscle now a little more information about the cephalic vein the cephalic vein you should know that it commences it is formed in the anatomical snuff box by the union of the lateral end of the dorsal venous arch with the lateral marginal vein there is commencement of the cephalic vein a subcutaneous vein in the anatomical snuff box it will continue along the lateral or the radial border the front of forearm it will become the content of the roof of the cubital fossa where it gives this branch median cubital vein then it continues along the lateral border of the biceps brachii subcutaneously in the arm then it ascends up running into the delto pectoral groove so this course of cephalic vein you are seeing is running in the delto pectoral groove where it will be accompanied by the deltoid branch of the thoracocromial artery and remember the cephalic vein is subcutaneous throughout its length in the upper limb and along its course it will also be accompanied by the lymphatics from the thumb and the lateral side of the forearm 
you can appreciate that it crosses the pectoralis minor muscle anteriorly, the cephalic vein. So in case if it's asked sometime that cephalic vein drains into axillary vein in which part? First, second or third part. So remember that cephalic vein because it crosses the pectoralis minor first and then drains into the axillary vein. So it is draining into the first part of axillary vein. And at that point where this drains, into the axillary vein, they find group of lymph nodes and these group of lymph nodes are called cephalic lymph nodes, also called as infraclavicular lymph nodes. So remember the lymphatic drainage from the thumb and its web and along the little part of the forearm, this is being drained into the infraclavicular or the cephalic group of lymph nodes. And both of these structures will perforate the clavipectoral fascia to reach into the axilla and drain into these lymph nodes. So remember where the cephalic vein dips down, that's a infraclavicular triangle or the deltopectoral triangle from where it dips down and then perforates the clavipectoral fascia and then drains into the infraclavicular or the cephalic group of lymph nodes. So that was a short revision about this venous drainage as well as the lymphatic drainage. Remember the rest of the lymphatic drainage, the upper limb drains into the lateral group of axillary lymph nodes. The middle side, the middle border, the primary lymph nodes may be the supratrochlear group of lymph nodes. But the efferent from the supratrochlear will drain into the lateral group of axillary lymph nodes. In short, you just remember that the entire lymphatic drainage of the upper limb drains into the lateral group of axillary lymph nodes, except the thumb and its web and the lateral part of the forearm. That drains into the infraclavicular group of lymph nodes. So now we got to know that the axillary vein is formed by the union of basilic vein and vena comitentis accompanying brachial artery and profunda brachial artery. Answer is choice B. Question number three. In Herb's Duchenne palsy, all of the following muscles are paralyzed except supraspinatus, deltoid, bicep brachii, pectoralis major. So supraspinatus, you know, is being supplied by which nerve? It is suprascapular nerve with root number C5 and C6. Deltoid is supplied by axillary nerve with root number C5, C6. Biceps brachii is supplied by musculocutaneous nerve with root numbers C5, 6 and 7. Pectoralis major is supplied by medial pectoral nerve and lateral pectoral nerve. Medial pectoral nerve is C A T one. Lateral pectoral nerve is C five, six, and C seven. Here you seeing is the nerve supply of pectoralis major muscle. You can see this is medial pectoral nerve. This nerve from within the axilla first innovates and perforates this muscle pectoralis minor and then innovates pectoralis major on its deeper surface. This nerve has root numbers C8 and T1. Now this lateral pectoral nerve, this nerve from within the axilla, it first perforates clavipectoral fascia and then it innovates pectoralis major on its deeper surface. This nerve, lateral pectoral nerve, has root numbers C5, C6 and C7. It arises from the lateral cord of brachial plexus, while the medial pectoral nerve is a branch from the medial cord of brachial plexus. So in this question number three, that in herbs paralysis, all the following muscles are paralyzed except. Now you got the answer because herbs Duchenne paralysis is due to injury of the upper trunk of brachial plexus carrying fibers from C5 and C6 spinal segments. So you can see that all the nerves here, they are carrying C5, C6 component. So supraspinatus will be paralyzed. 
then deltoid also will be paralyzed. Biceps brachii having C5, C6 component, this also will be paralyzed. Pectoralis major, because of its medial pectoral nerve having C8, T1 component, this muscle will not be paralyzed. So your answer here will be pectoralis major. Now the next question is, question number four. All of the following forms the boundaries of the lower triangular space of scapular region except teres major long head of triceps teres minor shaft of humerus for this you need to revise the intermuscular spaces in the scapular region the intermuscular spaces in the scapular region this one is the quadrangular space bounded by teres minor above teres major below on the medial side it is longer to triceps and laterally it's the upper end of the shaft of the humerus structures passing through this you can see is the posterior circumflex humeral vessels along with the axillary nerve now this using is the upper triangular space now this is bounded by teres minor above teres major below and laterally the base of the triangle is formed by the long end of triceps. The structures passing through this triangle are the circumflex scapular vessels, which are branches from the subscapular artery and tributary to the subscapular vein. Now this you are seeing is the lower triangular space. This space is bounded medially by the long end of triceps, laterally by the shaft of the humerus, and superiorly it's the base that base is formed by teres major and the structures passing through this triangle are the profunda brachial artery with its two vena comitants and radial nerve in the radial groove question number four all of the following forms the boundary of the lower triangular space of scapular region except so the answer here will be teres minor now question number five the tendon of which of the following muscle is the best guide to ulnar artery? Flexor carpi ulnaris, flexor digitorum superficialis, flexor digitorum profundus, palmaris longus. In this image, you are seeing the muscles, the nerves and vessels of the front of forearm. Here you can see is ulnar artery. This is asked in the question that where exactly you are going to palpate or locate the ulnar artery in the forearm. It's a part of surface anatomy. So for a better view, I'm zooming it out for you. I believe it's much more clearer now. So this you're seeing is flexor carpi ulnaris muscle. This ulnar artery and ulnar nerve, both of them, they're traveling under to the cover of flexor carpi ulnaris muscle. But when it reaches in the lower one third or the lower two third of the forearm the nerve and vessels they shift a little laterally towards the radial side and then emerge out just little to the tendon of flexor carpi ulnaris muscle at the wrist this is what you're seeing is the tendon the green color i'm using is the tendon of flexor carpi ulnaris right and you know it develops a pisiform bone in its tendon here and then it continues as pisiohamate ligament to get attached to the hook of hamate in the form of pisiohamate ligament and then it gets attached on the hook of hamate reaching up to the base of fifth metacarpal so what you're seeing is just immediately lateral to this tendon is ulnar nerve and even later to the nerve is ulnar artery and both of these structures you know they pass below a superficial slip of the flexor retinaculum that is called volar carpal ligament the space below to that that space created now this space is called Gwen's canal so in the Gwen's canal which structure lies medially is the ulnar nerve 
and what lies laterally is ulnar artery. So simply you've got the answer now to palpate. You can easily remember if it's asked like where exactly you're going to palpate for the radial artery. Now the radial artery is palpated just medial to the tendon of brachioradialis. This muscle is brachioradialis and this muscle is flexor carpi radialis tendon. So where exactly you palpate for the pulsations of the radial artery? Remember, you palpate the radial artery over to the distal end of the radius on the palmar surface at the level of the steroid process of the radius, just lateral to the tendon of flexor carpi radialis or just medial to the tendon of brachioradialis muscle. And in case if it's asked where you're going to palpate for the ulnar artery, just at the wrist lateral to the tendon of flexor carpi ulnaris muscle but you will have to go for a deep palpation because ulnar artery is relatively lying deep than the radial artery which is comparatively superficially placed so the answer to the question number five here will be flexor carpi ulnaris muscle next question number six oblique cord of the forearm is the fibrous remnant of flexor pollicis longus, flexor digitorum superficialis, flexor digitorum profundus, pronator teres. Now look carefully in this image. This is the oblique cord in the green color here. The oblique cord you're seeing, this oblique cord is morphologically a remnant of which muscle? So if you're looking carefully into the image, you can easily guess the answer. As you can see that this oblique cord is an extension from this muscle, flexor pollicis longus. So remember now that this oblique cord is a degenerated portion of this muscle, flexor pollicis longus. It's presumed that it also took origin from that point where this oblique cord is attached to ulna but that portion is now degenerated and it's converted into a cord and remember that it does has a significance in providing support or strength to the superior radio ulnar joint and also has a role in strengthening the supination and pronation movements at the superior radio ulnar joint you can also find the attachment of the oblique cord here in this image this is the point of attachment to ulna and radius. That's the side where this muscle flexor pollicis longus. It's presumed to continue like this. This muscle continues its attachment like this. So the answer here will be flexor pollicis longus. Now question number seven regarding lymph nodes. The lateral side of the arm and forearm and thumb is drained into the supratrochlear nodes, posterior axillary nodes, infraclavicular nodes, central axillary nodes. I have already explained the answer to this question. If you remember my explanation to question number one, the first MCQ. So you can watch the explanation from question number 4.1. So the answer here is infraclavicular nodes. These are also called as cephalic nodes. Question number eight, patella has a natural tendency to get dislocated in which direction? Superiorly, inferiorly, medially or laterally? Now look here carefully what I'm drawing is femur of the right side the anterior view this is resting on tibia like this and that's fibula it's here where this triangular sesamoid bone the largest sesamoid bone the patella is located now if you remember the attachments on patella on its base there's this big muscle coming from the front of shaft of femur that's called vastus intermedius this muscle gets attached here there's another muscle which is attached on the lateral border of the patella in upper one-third or upper two-third. This muscle is arising from the lateral lip 
of the linea aspera and is attached to patella on the lateral border like this. Only in the upper one third or a little more you can say but not to the entire lateral border. So this muscle is vastus lateralis. This is vastus intermedius. Onto the medial border, the upper three fourth of the medial border or even the entire length of the medial border of the patella. There's a muscle attached which takes origin from the medial lip of the linea aspera. And this muscle is vastus medialis. So you've seen that the vastus medialis has a wider attachment compared to the vastus lateralis. This has a significance. You should start guessing the answer. There's a muscle that covers vastus intermedius from above superficially. This muscle comes from the hip bone from the anterior inferior ilex spine as well as from a reflected head that comes from above the acetabulum. This muscle is bipinnate especially the superficial fibers of this muscle are bipinnate and this muscle is rectus femoris now on to the posterior surface of the apex of patella remember it is arising from the posterior surface of the apex of patella there is this broad thick tendon which inserts or gets attached to the upper half of the tibial tuberosity Remember, not on the lower portion, but on the upper portion. If it gets inserted in the lower portion, there will be hyperextension at the knee. And this is ligamentum patelli. Remember, it's a tendon. It's a misnomer actually. Ligamentum patelli is actually a tendon of quadriceps femoris. The four muscles mentioned above together form a composite muscle and that is called quadriceps femoris. This one, vastus intermedius, vastus lateralis, vastus medialis, rectus femoris together form a muscle called quadriceps femoris and the nerve supply is by femoral nerve. Now think about what will happen if all these four muscles, they're going to contract. When they'll contract, they will obviously pull this bone patella in this direction. Why not vertically? The reason, main reason is that femur is not vertically aligned over the tibia it is having an inclined position so remember the direction of the shaft of femur is directed downward backwards and medially so that's why the force upon patella from above will be directed upwards and laterally while this ligamentum patelli will be pulling patella downwards so thereby there will be a resultant vector created and this resultant vector will be forcing patella to get deviated on the lateral side. So that's the natural tendency in some people you'll find that when they plan to sit down in a squatting position the patella gets shifted laterally. It moves out of the intercondylar fossa of the femur and it's shifted laterally. So that's a natural tendency. But to prevent this natural tendency of patella being shifted laterally, there are two major factors. One, you should have guessed by now. And that is the reason I asked you to remember the asymmetrical insertion of vastus medialis. So this is one reason why vastus medialis has a wider insertion on the medial border compared to vastus lateralis because this helps to maintain a force on the medial side of patella while you are planning to flex and sit down in a squatting position. So this muscle vastus medialis is also called as locking muscle. This muscle vastus medialis causes locking of the knee joint while you are in the last 15 to 30 degrees of extension. Now there's one more factor which prevents this lateral dislocation is the bony fat. You know that patella, the anterior surface you've already seen, it's roughened having fine streaks like this. You can easily identify the anterior surface of the patella because you know it's tendon, it's embedded within the tendon and that is regular pattern of collagen fibers. So because of that you find there's vertical streaks like lining on the 
front of patella. But the posterior surface, you know, is smooth, the upper three-fourth, because the lower portion, that's the posterior surface of apex, you know, that provides attachment to the ligamentum patellae. So the upper three-fourth surface posteriorly is smooth and is covered by articular cartilage, that's hyaline cartilage, that participates in the patellofemoral joint. And the patellofemoral joint is what variety of joint? Yes, it is a saddle variety of synovial joint. So I'm drawing here is the posterior view of the right patella. So when you see the posterior with the right patella, you'll find that it's wedged. Actually, patella is like this in the posterior view. So being wedged, the more of the surface, this two-third is lateral surface and one-third is the medial surface. It's easy to remember L for lateral, L for larger surface. Remember this. And this lower surface, that's the posterior surface of the apex, it's here, which is not articular. This is non-articular surface of patella, which provides attachment to the ligamentum patellae. Now, the upper three-fourth surface of the patella, which is an articular surface, is actually divided like this into three portions, except a medial edge of the bone, which I'll tell you. So this is how we divide actually, it's a portion of the articular surface which comes into contact with femur at different stages of flexion of the knee joint. Let's presume this one is the area number one. This area number one comes in contact with femur while you are standing, that is in the full extension. But as you plan to sit down, this area number two, including area number one, that is area number one plus area number two, that much of area comes in contact with femur. That's in position of slight flexion, maybe beyond 30 degrees, you'll find area number one and two will contact femur. Now, when you reach a flexion of around 90 degrees or more, then this area number three will also be touching femur means area number one, two and three, all this area will be in contact with femur when you are flexing your knee beyond 90 degrees. But when you come in a full flexion of the knee joint, that is the stage of squatting position. When your back of leg touches the back of thigh, that's there, this medial edge of the patella, that is area number four. So that's how in case of squatting position, all the areas, one, two, three, four, they all will be touching femur, means what? The patella actually gets buried in the intercondylar fossa. You can palpate and feel it on yourself. In a squatting position, you find that patella has actually disappeared. Now the reverse pattern will be followed while you stand up from the squatting position. Firstly, the medial edge of the bone will come out of the intercondylar fossa, then three, then two, then finally when you will stand back in erect posture, it will be only area number one that will be touching femur. Now why not take a transverse cut section of patella? This is how you'll find is the right patella. All the images I'm drawing is of right side. This one is the anterior view. This is the posterior view. And this one now, the last one I've drawn is the transverse cut section. So obviously, as I told you, the, the larger area on the posterior surface, two third will be the lateral surface and the lesser area on the posterior surface will be the medial surface. So medially it is one third, laterally it is two third. L for lateral, L for larger. Remember this mnemonic, L for lateral, L for larger and this will even help you remember in the side determination very often it's asked in your viva was exam to you know to identify the side determination of patella so you can very easily confirm the side determination of patella by holding the patella as if it is your patella in your hand with the anterior surface placed anterior articular surface placed posteriorly the base of the patella should be above, the apex of patella should be below. And with this position, you place the patella on the table 
the side to which patella falls will be the side to which patella belongs right so that is how you can confirm the side determination of patella side determination of patella that also has been covered in this topic now imagine like in a squatting position in full flexion what happens is this is how patella gets buried in the intercondylar fossa of the femur right so because of its wedged surface the posterior surface being wedged you know it prevents the lateral dislocation so this is prevented this one is lateral side this is medial side so this posterior surface being wedged actually prevents the natural tendency of patella being dislocated laterally uh, one is this bony factor and the other is the locking mechanism because of asymmetrical wider attachment of vastus medialis on the medial border of patella so i hope you got the answer to this question number eight that patella has a natural tendency to get dislocated laterally next question question number nine locking muscle of knee joint is popliteus vastus medialis vastus lateralis adductor magnus now the answer to this question i've already explained with question number eight so the answer here will be that locking muscle of knee joint is vastus medialis remember popliteus is the unlocking muscle of the knee joint this muscle is unlocking unlocking muscle of the knee joint is popliteus and the locking muscle of the knee joint is vastus medialis now the last question is question number 10 lining epithelium of trachea is simple squamous epithelium simple cubical epithelium simple columnar ciliated epithelium pseudo stratified ciliated columnar epithelium now this is how you're going to find the lining epithelium of trachea so you can see is the basement membrane here and over to this you find cells of different heights so the nuclei you can see they are placed at different levels right the nuclei spreaded like one above another in a stratified manner but one more important thing is that all of these cells they may be of different heights but they all are touching the basement membrane some may be basal cells some may be columnar cells mostly all of them are columnar but some are small and basal cells which are meant for the replenishment of the fallen cells the dying out cells and you also have goblet cells in between right so these cells they are all touching the basement membrane and onto the surface you also appreciate that there is the cilia lining here so these are tall columnar cells but they are of varying heights so the nuclei appear stratified right the appearance of nuclei at different levels give it a stratified appearance that's why this epithelium is called pseudo stratified ciliated columnar epithelium remember it's a hallmark feature for identifying trachea apart from the hyaline cartilaginous rings deeper inside but this one this feature is a hallmark feature you know very commonly that you can say the prototype example of a pseudo stratified ciliated columnar epithelium is trachea right so it lines the airway passage right from the nasal chambers in the trachea and even reaching down to the principal bronchus however down below from the bronchioles onwards and the secondary bronchus tertiary bronchus onwards it's the simple columnar ciliated epithelium and the thickness of epithelium keeps thinning out as the airway passage continues down distally towards the parenchyma one another example of pseudo stratified ciliated epithelium you can add up here is the pathway of semen ejaculation right from the epididymis vas difference seminal vesicles ejaculatory ducts and even in the membranous and penile urethra also you find a pseudo stratified ciliated columnar epithelium so the answer to the question number 10 is 
pseudostratified ciliated columnar epithelium.